All right, Ephesians. If you're not there, get there. When you're there, say, I'm here. Oh, fantastic. All right, Jesus, we thank you for your word. I ask you this morning, Lord, that your spirit would make the word come to life this morning. We thank you, Jesus, that these words are not just words that we're reading, but they're living and active. And we thank you that as we go into this this morning, that it's not just what was, it's that you want to do something now through your word. So we just re- we receive all that you have this morning. I ask you that you would just prepare our hearts this morning. We thank you for what you are doing at Convergence, for what you're doing in this area and in this region. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. All right, book of Ephesians. Last week we went over Ephesians chapter 1. This week we are going over Ephesians chapter 2. I, I don't have time to go over the... Uh, Kind of our intro there, what was happening, where was he writing, the date was AD 60 to 62, the setting was Ephesus, southwest corner of modern day Turkey. Uh, This is a prison letter, he wrote this while he was in prison. Uh, It's one of four prison letters, Uh, we have Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon are the four prison letters that Paul wrote. Um, And so, why was Paul writing Ephesians? Uh, This is, again, this is my kind of my paraphrase, uh, hey guys, you're doing an amazing job, but I want to just exhort you to stay the course. I want to make sure you're anchored to the truth found in Jesus. I want you to be in unity under Jesus. I want you to see life with Jesus through the Holy Spirit as a vibrant, spirit-led, life-giving adventure where everything is in subjection to him. And so we touched on some key points uh, last week in chapter 1. And now we are in chapter 2, and the title in my Bible is Made Alive in Christ. We haven't even gotten to the the verses yet. That's good. You're made alive in Christ. Uh, We'll get there. Verse 1, and you were what? Dead. Does it say kind of dead? Does it say only certain trespasses are dead? Very dead. All the way dead. It's all the way dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you what? Okay, you should underline formally. Because sometimes you need to remind yourself that this was formally. In which you formally walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That's some heavy language there, isn't it? So verse 1, you were dead because of sin. You were lost and without hope, but Jesus, right? Verse 2, in which you formerly walked, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. So Paul starts off, uh, verse 2, saying, you were this because it was what you formerly walked in according to the world. Which is according to the prince of the power of the air. Uh, 1 Peter 5.8 says, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. What's the devil's intention? To devour. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that what? You may have life, right? So these are powerful words. Uh, Paul is echoing this here. He's saying there is an enemy who is present, and he desires to rule your life. He desires to rule your life. Uh, Ephesians 6, when we get into Ephesians 6, we get into the armor of God, but what does, Peter, what does Paul say? He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So this is a key aspect that you're going to see in this letter, which is this. There's a war taking place. This war is against the powers of darkness. It's light versus battle. You were born in light versus darkness. You were born into a battle. So this phrase right after, the sons of disobedience, means those who have submitted their lives to the power of darkness. Uh, Tyndall says this, if, if people are surrendered to the power of evil, 
They become those whose habit of life is contrary to the living God. And so they are rightly called the sons of disobedience. If you are living contrary to Jesus in a life of evil, then you are living a life of disobedience. So Paul is not, Paul is not mincing words here. He's not laying off. He's being very clear. It matters who you are submitted to. And there's two choices. Follow Jesus. Follow the enemy. Light. Darkness. Light cannot, darkness cannot stay in light. And then verse 3, he says, Among two we all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. He's saying, we used to live, this is what we used to do, we used to live in the longings and the impulses of a self-centered life. That word wrath, actually in the Greek, actually means children of impulse. What does that mean? If I'm just operating off of impulse, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm going my own road. I'm doing my own thing. Um, I'm not a child that's following uh, light or God. I'm just kind of, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm, I'm caught in myself. So operating purely by your own impulses and living a self-centered life will keep you from full surrender. Because you won't be willing to give you up in order to fully have him. The gospel is very clear. You give up your way and you get his way, which is the only way. (laughs) This is the narrow road. You want to know what the narrow road is? I don't want my way. I want his way. And that becomes the only way. This is one of the major things that we see in our culture. We love ourselves. We love ourselves. And there's an aspect of like confidence and security in who you are. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being so caught up in ourselves that we actually can't see others and we actually can't submit to God fully. That's what I'm talking about. That's living by impulse. That's, li- that's doing my own thing, following the ways of the world. And this has created an issue In culture, like, there's no absolute truth. You can have it however you want it. All of these things stem from this place of the fact that I want to do my thing. I want to be right. Or now it's, I am right, and you can't tell me that I'm wrong. Right? So there's all this stuff happening um, in culture right now. And actually, Timothy talks about this. He says, for the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. You want to know what the ultimate step of this is? You finding religion, teachers, and places that gratify your desires. That's where we get into false teaching. That's where we get into places where there isn't, we don't really care what this says. Because we want to do things our own way. And so we have to be willing to lay aside being children of our own impulses and be willing to just be a child of God. So Paul is saying, this is who we used to be. If we're not careful, though, we can stay stuck here. The formally is meant to be formally. It's not something we look in the rearview mirror at all the time. It's not something that we need to allow to become our identity again. This is who we were before Jesus. But what does verse 4 say? Someone help me. But what? But God. Look, all the lusts of the flesh, all the, all the stuff that you were formerly stuck in, all of the past, the stuff in the rearview mirror, all of that stuff is formally because of God. Being rich in what? Mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he did what? Made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. That's good news this morning. He is, listen, 
He is wealthy in mercy. God's not poor in mercy. He's not, there's not an aspect of him that's like, oh, I just don't have enough mercy for that this morning. He's rich, overflowing, yeah. abundant. Oh, come on. Some of you are like, I just don't know if you have enough mercy for me this morning, God. And he's like, I'm rich in it. I, I, I'm wealthy in mercy. I'm desiring to lavish you with my kindness and grace. Why? Because of his love for us. In the midst of everything we just read, in the midst of us being stuck in our own way, us being lost, us walking in disobedience, us gratifying the desires of our flesh, and us being stuck in the world, he chose to make us alive together with him. By grace you have been saved. There's a phrase, uh, there's a word that we, we use, it's more of a, kind of more of a scholarly, maybe seminary word, but it's regeneration. What, is, what does regeneration mean? It means to be reborn, to be born again. Uh, and it means this, that through the work of the Holy Spirit, you are now spiritually alive. You were dead. You were lost in your transgressions, but now through faith in Jesus, you have been made new. Oh, come on, you guys got to get this this morning. Reborn means that you were old. Not, not, not maybe, you were old, but now you are new. And not kind of new, not maybe new, reborn, made alive. What does it mean? You've literally had a new birth. <laughs> you have been reborn. You've been made alive. You are now spiritually alive. And this can only happen because of the inner working of the Holy Spirit through salvation in Jesus. Listen, we don't need a little home makeover renovation. God's not in the business of just a little home makeover home addition, you know. Um, God's not in, in the business of just a partial changing. God's not in the business of just a partial transforming. The Bible is clear. You need to be reborn, born again, regenerated, brought to life. What does that mean, though? It means the old, bye-bye old, hello, new life in Jesus. So what does that mean that we get to do? Live in the new life with Jesus. And say the old things are what? Formally. Verse 6. Let's keep going. And raised us up with him. And seated, someone say seated, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh, we're going to unpack this for a minute. You need to know that you're seated next to him, with him. And in fact, I want to do an illustration real quick. Um, can I get three volunteers? Just raise your hand. Three volunteers, okay, Santana, who else? Oh, we got <laughs> Gideon, uh, yes, right here. Remind me your name. Asher. Asher, fantastic, I love this, this is great. Okay, now let me get, I got some chairs for you guys, okay? Actually, if you guys want to help, that'd be awesome. There's two more in there. Oh, wow. Really helping. I love it. You guys can set them right here. All right. So just set that one next to you. Okay, cool. Awesome. Oh, this is going to be so fun. All right. Let's actually scoot them up a little bit. All right. All right, so we got you guys. All right, so here's, I'm going to read a verse. You guys hang out right there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull you right in just a second. Real quick, in your Bible, turn back to Ephesians 1.15. Should be just one page. 1.15. What does it say? 
For this reason, I too haven't heard of, uh, among the, uh, the saints of the Lord Jesus, which is existing among you. Okay, sorry. That's not the right verse. We'll get there. Verse 20. It's wrong in my notes. Verse 20. Which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And what? Who is seated? Okay, so what does that imply? Who's already seated? Yes, but also the Father, right? Because <laughs> he's seating Jesus there. Okay, so uh, Gideon, come here. You're going to be the Father. He's real excited about that. <laughs> All right, so the Father has seated Jesus at his right hand. Let's see. Asher, why don't you be Jesus? All right. All right, so we got the Father. We got the Son. We got an empty chair, right? All right. Let's read this verse again. Let's read this verse again. And raised who up? Me. Raised us up and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So Santana, come sit here. All right, so we got the Father. We got the Son, Jesus. And we have Santana. Oh, and Santana has the Holy Spirit who is in her. And also, Genesis says the Holy Spirit's hovering about the water. So the Spirit is present. Right? And so we've got this happening. So I want you to see, right? The Father was here. Jesus, he raised Jesus up with him and seated him at the right hand of the Father. But now Ephesians 2, 6 says that not only did he raise Jesus up, now he's raised you up. Oh, come on. Oh, you're going to get this in a minute. What does it mean to be seated? Ephesians 6.11 says, when it's talking about the armor of God, it says, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the enemy. So standing is talking about going on the offense. It's like def- offense and defense. It's, it's a posture of action. Seated implies that you are resting in identity. It's a, it's a posture of resting. Um, you're seated, Right? When I think about seated, maybe this is just me, um, I think a, a little more relaxed. You know, maybe I'm picturing myself in my chair every morning, drinking my coffee, opening the word. I'm feeling a little relaxed. I'm feeling more like I'm getting a chance to rest. Now, I know that's not always the case for those that are seated at work. So work, work with me here, okay? So Paul is intentionally describing two distinct realities in Ephesians. You are to continue to stand firm and you are already seated. Wait, hold on. How can you be standing and seated? Seated is positional. It's positional. What's positional? It means it isn't something you have to keep doing. Oh. Seated is not something you have to keep doing. It is your position in Christ in the heavenly places. You don't have to keep trying to be seated. You are seated. It is finished. Oh, you rest in the seat. You are seated with Christ. Yeah, you guys keep hanging out. Sorry, I know. You guys can hang. That'd be great. Um, In leadership circles, you may hear people talk about something called positional power. What is positional power? Positional power is granted by the position rather than the individual's attributes. Also known as legitimate power, it is accepted by the people subject to it. So a leader that carries positional power, listen, has power and authority because of their position. You have access to power and authority because of your position. It's called positional power. Okay? So think about this. As a believer, you have positional power and authority over the kingdom of darkness because you are seated above it. Not because of you, but because of Jesus. Because your position is in Christ. 
It is seated with him. So your position is in heavenly places, not because of your individual merit, but because by believing in Jesus, you are put there. Oh, some of you, you need to clap a little louder for that. It means that you, listen, it means you didn't put yourself there. You can't put yourself there. You can try as hard as you want to try. You can work as hard at life as you want to work, and you will not be able to ever put yourself in that seat. It is because in Christ Jesus, he has raised you. He has put you there. Okay? All right. Santana, I want you to try to do something. It might be kind of hard. I want you to try to pick up your seat and stand. You may have to, like, put the... Yeah, yeah, yes. Stand up. There it is. Yes, yes. Okay, can you hold it for just a second? (laughs) What's the illustration here? This is Ephesians. You stand firm while seated. Right? You stand firm. What does that mean? You stand against the enemy knowing your position in Christ. The only way you stand firm is if you're seated. You can't stand firm if you're not seated. Why? Because your power and authority only comes as you are seated. So the Christian life is one of standing while seated. She's like, man, this is a workout this morning. So my ability to stand against the enemy comes as I know my position. Okay, you can sit down. Sorry. This changes the way you war because you war from being seated. Oftentimes, I think we go to battle against the enemy trying to throw everything we have at him in terms of religious activity. We try to do more spiritual things instead of warring from being seated in heavenly places. It's not about how much religious activity you do. It's about where does my authority lie? Where does that come from? So there's a huge difference. Listen, the enemy has to bow at the feet of Jesus. The enemy has no authority where there's light. The enemy doesn't have access, but you do. You have it because you didn't do anything, but because he put you there. So there's a difference between warring with an orphan mindset and the security of a son and daughter adopted into the household of God. All right, stand up for a second, Santana. I'm going to move this way over here for a second. And you can go ahead and sit back down. Okay. Off, this is an orphan mindset. You think there's this gap here. Maybe I, if I do enough stuff, if I do enough religious activity, if I pray hard enough, if I can do enough, maybe I can bridge this chasm that I feel between myself and God. That's orphan mindset. Right? The orphan mindset's usually one of fear. You feel insufficient. You're having to figure it out on your own, so much so that you feel apart from God. So Santana's over here, and she thinks she's over here when really she's right here. Sons and daughters, okay, you you can stand up. I'm going to move you back. Okay, go ahead and sit one more time. Okay. Sons and daughters operate from the place of being loved. They don't look at things from the standpoint of there may not be enough. Is there enough mercy? Is there enough power? Is there enough authority? Is there enough grace? Is there enough for me? Yes. Right? They don't have to look far for affection. They don't have to look for inheritance. They have it. So I think this is the difference between us aimlessly yelling at things and calling it warfare And knowing you are seated. I'm not aimlessly wandering around trying to figure out, okay, let's see, if I do this over here, maybe that'll work. No, 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 no. Seated. Resting in him means that's where my authority comes from. And now I don't have to aimlessly wander around and try to figure out how to overcome the enemy. I get to operate from a place of I carry light, which infiltrates darkness. The power and authority come from being seated next to him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, which means darkness has to bow, but not because I'm aimlessly wandering around trying to find something to yell at, because there's authority within me that bows at his feet.
What's the point? When you're this close, you don't have to worry if he hears you. Can you imagine if Santana were to try to say something right now, like Asher would hear her. But if she's way over here, she thinks she's over here doing her own thing. And then she thinks she has to yell because she feels like she's this far apart. When really all she has to do is do what John did, which is leaning on the bosom of Jesus, leaning on my beloved. Being here allows you, I mean, she could whisper right now and Asher would hear. That's what it looks like to fight while seated next in heavenly places. You guys can go. Thank you. So good. I'll move back for my camera people. Did you guys catch that reality? Did you get that? So you should leave this place today and you should go, if something comes up, I'm seated. I'm seated in heavenly places. All right, we got to move. We are only, where are we at? We're only in verse 7. Woo! So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Another reason that he has seated you with him is so he can constantly show you the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness. That's the so that. So that implies that his heart for you to be seated with him is to show you the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness. Uh, The phrase in the ages to come signifies the fact that this never ends. It never ends. In the ages, 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 because we are going to rule with him, right? And so it's in the ages to come. He will constantly, for all of eternity, be lavishing his grace and kindness and mercy on you. You will see him in that way for all of eternity, in the ages to come. Which means that for all of eternity, we get to get lost in him. Oh, that's good. All right, verse 8. For by grace, most of you probably know this verse, have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of yourself. You can't do it. Not because of anything you, can, you have done or can do, but because it is a gift of God. So you get to be seated and, rec- and receive that gift. Not as a result of works. You can't work for it. You can't get to boast in yourself. You get to boast in him. So that no one may boast. Verse 10. We are his what? Workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared before him so that we would walk in them. I love this verse. Boy, it's going to be really hard to get all the way through this morning. Because I want to kind of pause here too. Uh, the word workmanship in the Greek is the word poema. And that word actually means work of art. It means masterpiece. So Paul is saying, for you are his masterpiece. You are his work of art. He created you. You were created for good works. He created you, and as you walk with him, because you are his and following him, the outflow of your life is that you will produce good works, and this was prepared beforehand. Meaning what? He had purpose in creating you. This is a significant verse. He fashioned you. You were created exactly the way he wanted to create you, which also reveals that every life is important. Every life, because he creates with intention and purpose. Every life matters. Every life matters. Every life matters, which also means every baby matters. Every baby matters. Every baby matters. He creates with intention. 
He creates with purpose. You were created and fashioned in him. So it means that every baby from the point of conception is important to him and it should be important to us. This is a high value as believers. We know that life matters. If you are God's workmanship, he created you with purpose. And I just think right now, especially with the temperature of culture, this is not an issue or a value that we need to just sit back on and just kind of hang out with. We need to actually be willing to stand up for the fact that we value life. We care about it, which means that we do not value abortion. Now, I say that knowing that if there are people in the room or watching and you've had an abortion, there's no shame or condemnation. Because through repentance and forgiveness, God wants you to know that he loves you. and He wants to minister to your heart in that place. But I just want us to know that we value life because we believe that we are his workmanship. Every baby is his workmanship. It was, it's his masterpiece. It's his work of art. He didn't just say, oh, yeah, there's another baby. No, he fashioned that baby in its, its mother's womb, and it has a purpose, and it has a calling, and right now is the time that as believers, you have got to stand up for that. You've got to be willing to stand up for that. I celebrate the fact that Roe versus Wade was overturned, but there's more that the Lord wants to continue to do in that. You are his masterpiece. All right, verse 11. Let's see how many verses we can get through. Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, Excluded from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, oh, look for the but nows. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What's happening? Circumcision was the external sign of participation in the covenant that God established with Israel. Okay, Paul is coming in and he's calling on the Gentile believers to remember that they were once separate. Circumcision was the seal of the covenant with Israel, which was performed in the flesh by human hands. It marked that Israel was God's people, which meant that the Gentiles, those that are not Jews, were excluded and had no hope and were without God but Jesus. That's where you read verse 13 and you go, but now in Christ Jesus, you Gentile who were formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. And we already talked about Ephesians 1. What's the seal? The Holy Spirit. No longer is it, is it an external thing that human hands, it's him. It's the Holy Spirit. All right, you Gentiles have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. All right, ah, oh, man, there's so much here. This is so difficult. Oh, I want you to see something really quickly. Does it say that he just brought peace? What does it say? He is our peace. Oh, what's the difference? If I can bring peace in one situation, it might be temporary. Temporary peace. But if he is my peace, that means I have access to peace that doesn't have to be temporary. He is our peace who made both groups, Jew and Gentile, into one. He broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself, Jesus, 
might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Again, not something you can do. He did it. Making the two into one new man. It's it's, it's the new covenant which does away with the hostility by him being the peace, not just bringing peace. Meaning, peace is unity under Jesus through the new covenant, which is Jew and Gentile both. It's the only way it's possible. And might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by having put to death the enmity. And he came, verse 17, and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. Peace to both groups. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. This is where you pause with a Selah moment and you go, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. And then you get to read 19. So then, so then, you are no longer strangers. You're not far. You're not a stranger. You're not alienated anymore. What are you? Fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Paul uses the words you are to say that Gentile believers are no longer on the outside looking in, but are citizens adopted into the family of God through Jesus. You are, we are all part of God's household. That's good news. That is good news. All right, verse 20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, verse 21, being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, verse 22, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. That's good. It's a lot of scripture, I know. I'm giving you a lot this morning. Christ Jesus is the cornerstone. Everything, everything, everything is built upon that cornerstone. Everything. He is the cornerstone. He is the cornerstone. And then there's a foundation of apostles and prophets, which I love. Uh, Apostle, that one who is sent with a message. Teaching. One who is sent with a message. Prophet. Uh, the word of the Lord. It's built on the foundation of the fact that you can hear the word of the Lord. That we have prophets still today that help, that even bring words and help us bring us into that. But also you are prophetic and you can hear the voice of the Lord. Right? So it's the found, that, that's, that's the foundation. It's apostles and prophets. So foundation on the apostles' teaching and prophetic word of the Lord. And we can't lose these two things. We need teaching, we need to be sent, and we need to hear God's voice. We need the logos, and we need the now rhema word. So this is the foundation. In whom the whole building, so now he's giving this picture of a building, is being fitted together. It's almost like a puzzle. He's bringing all of the pieces. What are some of the pieces? You. All of us together in community. You're part of the piece that makes the building whole. Some of you, you you may be down here on the lower foundation. Maybe some of you are up here. But every piece of this fitting together matters. Every piece. So some of you, if you're like, I, don't, I just don't know if I bring anything to the table. Yeah, you're a piece that the Lord wants to fit into the building. You're a piece that the Lord wants to fit in. He wants to set you in to community. He wants to set you in to the whole building as we all together are growing in a, into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom we are also being built together. Someone say together. Does that mean alone? Does it mean lone ranger? 
Does it mean that you should go off and just do your own thing and never actually plug into community? No. Isolation will kill you. I'm just telling you, don't be isolated. Plug in. Plug into community. All right, I need to land the plane. If you can grab your communion elements. Did you guys grab this this morning? Is, is this good? Okay. Ephesians 2 just like really got me this week. Now we should all move away from here and picture ourselves seated but standing. Okay? If you didn't take away from that, you need to, yeah. If I can get this open, maybe we can start. Is this a sign, Bobby, that we need to go back to the old school? Okay. Oh, I'm getting a lot of echoes out of that. Might have been a dangerous thing to say. All right. Jesus. We thank you for your body. We thank you that everything that we just read, all of the times where it says, because of Jesus, for in Christ Jesus, you were far off, but Jesus. You were alienated, lost, without hope, but Jesus. But Jesus, who brought you near by his blood. He brought you near. He brought you so near that he seated you in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. So Lord, this morning we come, and we don't come, I, I, I know we, we receive the elements often here, Lord, but I want us to come with fresh awe and wonder this morning. Lord, we're not, we're not just getting caught in just a, just a thing that we do, Lord. We don't want to just participate just to do it and just to get it over with. We are here to receive what you have done and to step into it. It is only, it is only the only way that the enmity, the only way that we could be brought into God's household, the only way is because of what he went through on the cross. It was the only way. It is the only way. So Jesus, this morning, we see you. We see the lashes that you went through. The 39 lashes, Lord. The crown of thorns upon your head. For the joy that was set before you, you endured the cross. Because you knew what was on the other end. You knew that you could take all of this, all of the trespasses, all of the trespasses, all of the trespasses, all of the transgressions, all of the stuff, and you could take it upon your body so that we might be brought near so that we could come near, so that there could be union, so that we could be seated next to you. It was only by what you did, Lord. So we just stop, and we do, even as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when he said, and giving thanks. We stop and we give thanks. Thank you, Jesus, that this morning we are here And we get to be ones who get to say, we just read about how we're alive in Jesus only because of Jesus. So we thank you, Lord. You took the bread. When they had given thanks, you broke it. And he said, this is my body. Take it. He took the cup and he
he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. (laughs) Your blood was spilled so that we don't have to be old, but that we can be new. We can walk in the new man. We can walk and be alive with Christ, Lord. We thank you for your blood. And we thank you for your blood that is fresh this morning to wash. It is fresh this morning to cleanse. It is fresh this morning to reconcile, to restore. It is fresh this morning to heal. It is fresh this morning to to bring freedom to those that need freedom because his blood is still speaking. Because we thank you that your blood is enough. It's enough. What you did was enough. Because you said it is finished. Our salvation with you is finished. And also we get to look to the fact that our salvation There is a salvation yet to be through your return. And that's what Paul says in verse 26 when he says, For as often, for as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes. So we thank you for that, Lord. And we just say, even just as a church this morning, Lord, we just say, Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, Lord. Amidst all the shaking, amidst everything that's going on, Lord, we will be a people that cry, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha, Lord, come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. And we look to that day, Lord, and we just say, Lord, we will walk and we will step into what you have done. We just thank you, so we receive. Jesus, right now, we just bless what you're doing. We just bless everybody here. We bless everybody that's watching online, Lord. And I ask you that you would not just allow us to read this and have it be a good Sunday message, Lord but that you would actually shift the way that we see things, that you would shift things, that you would shift things so that we could rightly step into who we are in Jesus. So I just ask you that this would be something that we would sit on, that we would marinate in, Lord, that we would grasp the full weight of the fact that we are seated with you, Lord, that we have been brought near, Lord, that we are alive, that we don't have to look at the old stuff anymore, Lord, that maybe some of us, maybe we've spent too much time looking in the rear view mirror, and the Lord's like, hey, all that stuff, it's for you to learn and grow. It's not for you to keep, keep staring at. Look forward. Look at who I am. Look at what I've done. So we just thank you for that, Lord. And we thank you. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for life. We thank you that we are your workmanship, Lord. We thank you that we are your work of art, Lord. We thank you that every life matters. Every life matters. And we thank you for what you're doing in this hour, Lord. And we just say yes to all that you're doing here at Convergence, here in DFW, Lord. We thank you for the salvations that feed the fort yesterday. We thank you for what you've done in Mexico, Lord, in Reynosa. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you're doing, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for the harvest. We thank you for us stepping in in this season and saying, Lord, would you do even more? We just say yes to that in Jesus' name. Amen.